The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. Here we are again. We are broadcasting live from Georgetown, Texas on November 18, 2018 another edition of Chalcedon Q&A and Meet of the Word. I'm Martin Sobretti. I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. And uh, if you see the curtains moving behind me, it's because uh, the cats are deciding to uh, learn a little something, too. Looks like we have ground control in place. That's all good. Oh, wow. Four people showed up suddenly. Excellent. Well, we have a whole bunch of questions um, that came in online. I'm wondering if I might not uh, intersperse some live ones with these. But I do want to get to as many of these as we can, because one of them got laid over from last week inadvertently. Actually, two of them. Uh, Roger Oliver asked, Last week we discussed Denis Lemarot's version of the ver theory of revolutionary creation and his creative exegesis of Genesis 1.11. He mentions the new old theory of knowledge known as the two divine books. I found the following graphic an example about concord concordism. If you have time, I'd like to hear your response. Thanks, Roger. Uh, <clears throat> basically, this is not a new theory. Uh, the double revelation hypothesis uh, actually came, got into the uh, crosshairs of uh, Dr. John C. Whitcomb, Jr. Uh, back in 1963, he wrote a book called The Origin of the Solar System and the Double Revelation Hypothesis. And the thesis of the Double Revelation Hypothesis, what a mouthful, is that God has two books, right? There's the book of nature and there's the book of scripture. And... Uh, Basically, God keeps two sets of books, and uh, he cooks the books in a way such that you can't really rely on what one book says in respect to the other. So you drive a huge wedge in sense of what God is or is not revealing. And once you have that, of course, then natural law is suddenly elevated as a principle. And so it's, and it's an old idea. That's 55 years ago that this was published on. That's more than half a century that there's been awareness and frontal attack on this. And this brings us back around to my big concern many times I go to conferences and say, you know, we have all these victories in the past, and we seem to lose sight of them, and then we have to recover that ground again, reinvent the wheel. So here's another example where something floats through the air and says, hey, a new theory, not new. Yeah, literally an example of what Ecclesiastes says, nothing new under the sun, and this had been resoundingly dealt with by previous scholars more than half a century ago. So it seems to be that we, when we have victories and we gain ground, we are not aware of it, and therefore we can be spooked into withdrawing and say, oh, there's a challenge here. What are we going to do? This is some new challenge. Not a new challenge, and it has been dealt with. Uh, Whitcomb, I believe, was um, head of uh, one of the theology departments at uh, Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, if I recall right. Uh, Long-standing Old Testament scholar who knows what he's speaking about. In any event, those are some of my thoughts. Is One, it's not new. Two, it's been already dealt with. Uh, and sometimes they come up with different little twists and nuances, but the fundamental doctrine idea is the same. Uh, and here's the where it gets dicey, right? Because in Isaiah 820, it says, along the testimony, they speak not according to these, it's because there's no light in them. And all of a sudden, this book is not only casting judgment on every other religious uh, writing, say, of um, cults and uh, things on that order, but it also is casting darkness on the second book of, that God allegedly wrote. But the fact of the matter is, there is no second book <laughs> in that sense that is in conflict and in competition with the Word of God. The Word of God is going to be here when the universe is gone, right? Uh, my word shall stand even when everything else is gone. Heaven and earth shall pass away. So whatever else is, if there is such a thing as a second book of nature, it's on borrowed time, it's going to be gone, and the only book that's going to stand at the end of time is the one. Uh, but there is no such thing as a second book of nature, especially one that is pitted against the scripture, and so that people then use this to have their cake and eat it. Now, I want to be a Christian, but I also want to uh, adopt Darwinism and things like that. This is uh, not a um, 
this is an oil and water mixture this is a clay and uh, iron literally and it doesn't hold together now it, people can certainly whitewash something and make it look like it holds together people can tell a good story but that doesn't mean it's a true story All right. next can question came in from uh, Gary Carmel's uh, and we missed this last week why are our first and second Maccabees accepted as canon in Catholicism while third and fourth Maccabees are considered apocryphal well, one of the bigger questions we might want to ask is why are the first and second Maccabees considered canonical? Uh, primarily, there's a point in time where the uh, the Protestant position was that the Word of God is subordinate to, um, or rather the, the kingdom, the Christianity, the church is subordinate to the Word of God. Word of God's up here, and the church is this. The church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth, and uh, therefore it is grounded on the scriptures. And uh, the position of the Roman Catholic Church was closer to the fact that, no, the church is up here and it has authority over Scripture. And one way to force the issue during the Reformation is to say, we're going to throw our weight around and we're going to do, uh, actually take control of the canon and declare these various books as canonical that the Protestants did not regard as canonical. So even over Erasmus's objections, these changes were made over against their best scholars simply because they needed to ha establish the principle that the church has authority even over Scripture. And uh, so, But... They apparently had some scruples about it because they looked at second, uh, the, um, third Maccabees and they recognized it had a whole bunch of problems apart from the legendary things. The notion of uh, intoxicating elephants to enrage them and to kill something was actually transplanted uh, from another instance more than almost two centuries later. So the book was a mess. It, it literally was a mess of legendary things. And even they thought this is a bridge too far. Uh, we can probably get away with this with first and second Maccabees, but once we get into third Maccabees and the things that are alleged to happen actually before the Maccabean books, first and second, because this takes us back to um, um, Ptolemy Philopater and to 20 BC thereabouts, uh, and then inserts in stories about persecutions that happen much, much later uh, and wound them all together, it's a mess. So it really was, I guess, in a sense, a failure of nerve. They, they realized that they could not actually get away with it. Uh, they could pull this stunt off with other things, but not this. So, uh, now, oh, this is a very good point. I actually have um, Ground Control waiting to put up a link that I provided for them this morning, which is a great book. If you don't have this book, get it on Kindle or hard copy. I have it both ways. Uh, it's called uh, the, the Canon of Scripture, a presuppositional study by Dr. Philip Kaiser. Uh, highly recommended, deals with the question of what is and what is not canonical. Uh, builds on a lot of the work from previous scholars and then uh, develops it even deeper. So it would be a very, very powerful study. Highest recommendation from us at Calcedon for that book. Thank you. Drum control. So there's a link. If you're interested in this topic, uh, it's a worthwhile book. Over 500 pages, but, but excellent material. Powerful. The same uh, questioner, Gary, asked, can you recommend any books on biblical history? Now, if we're talking about the history uh, uh, of the Old Testament and things like that, uh, we would be looking at, I like, like Hengstenberg's, The History of the Kingdom of God in the Old Testament, which would be a very, very good place. It's been republished by Whipth and Stock. By that, it didn't mean they retypeset it. It simply means that uh, <laughs> they photolithographed the old 1800s version of it, but it's readable, and you can get through it, and it's good, and it's very, very good. So uh, that would be one starting place, because Hengstenberg, who died, I think, 1862, uh, was really the the top Old Testament scholar uh, in Germany at the time. Uh, significant because he was going toe-to-toe -to -toe against Gazanius over, say, the Isaiah 714 controversy. Was it a virgin or was it uh, just a, a, a maiden, uh, what, just a lady getting pregnant and having a child? So Hengstenberg took the conservative tack against the more liberalizing tendencies of Gazanius. So that'd be one place to go for uh, looking through the history of the scriptures uh, and what it, and the story that's told in there, my recommendation. If we're talking about church history, of course, Philip Schaff's volumes are well known, but there's another scholar who's also interesting and takes has a take on it that I think expands on and sees things that Schaff does not necessarily catch, and that would be Augustus Neander. Uh, Neander was well known uh, to Rushton himself uh, and uh, other Chalcedon scholars. Uh, have his old materials on the shelf here too. Uh, Neander was uh, also worth looking at in terms of church history. Now, if you're looking at uh, biblical history, in other respects, you may want to see uh, look at Rushtuni's lectures or sermons lectures on world history because he also brings in uh, where the Bible comes into play in some of these areas.
this. So then, of course, there's the. Um, I guess I would just leave it at that because I, we can always have follow-up questions on that. Ah, oh, Roger asks another question. Roger Oliver. Growing up in the 50s and 60s, the King James translation of 1 Thessalonians 5.22 was often used to teach us to avoid even the appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The point being, even if you aren't doing anything wrong, take precautions to avoid the possibility of even being misinterpreted and accused of evil. The question goes on and on, but you get the, the point. Is that the King James translation says, you know, looks to say, don't do anything that looks like it might be evil. So you have to be um, supercilious and, and punctilious about all these points. Uh, and the question is, is that the right interpretation? Well, we kind of inherited this from bad interpretations, going back actually as far as Luther. Uh, R.C.H. Lenski, a Lutheran scholar, explains how this happened. Actually, this is worth uh, catching here. Uh, the, he translates it more correctly, for, from every form of what is wicked, hold yourselves off. Um, and because we're just the opposite of the excellencies from the preceding verse in First Thessalonians 21. Uh, so the opposite of the excellent thing is not uh, merely something bad, but the entire expression, every form of what is wicked. The every is, is definite, comprehensive, blah, blah, uh, of what is wicked. And so Trench and uh, other scholars make a distinction between morphe and schema, the form and fashion that's inherent in the object, irrespective of the fact whether it's seen by others or not, and eidos, which is the word used here, eidon, form as seen. Yet the latter is not a, a mere appearance. This is where it gets interesting. The latter, the word that's actually used here, is not a mere appearance without a corresponding substance, as Luther has translated allen berzen schein, which is also the translation of the uh, authorized version, all appearance of evil. The latter, this wrong translation, would mean that we are to avoid everything that looks wicked to those who happen to see it, although it may not be wicked at all. What is said by Paul is that wickedness has many forms, every one of which is really wickedness, and also appears so to men, and we are to keep away from every form that wickedness may assume. In other words, if we're going to use this, it would, it's, a, the, it's like the appearing of something is not the perception of it, but the actual presence of it. We're talking about the appearance of Christ, or someone making an appearance at this, on the stage, they're there. It's not just the appearance or, or a, a um, hologram, <laughs> like we have today, but the reality. So... Uh, Lenski nails it. We have actually been working under a false uh, assumption, uh, and that's simply attributed to the, uh, the King James. Now, more modern translations, setting aside the kind of text they're using, um, uh, at least get the proper translation of I don't write, which is the form of evil. Uh, abstain from every form that evil could take, but not just mere appearance, as Lenski points out. So that kind of cl clears that up. Because there are many things that Jesus did and other uh, people, saints in Scripture did that have the appearance of evil. Um, God even having Elijah eat food delivered by ravens is, has the appearance of evil. But it's not. Don't, don't go by that. Uh, Ford Schwartz asked an interesting question. I like this one. In the audio eschatology series, Rush speaks at length of judgment as process and event. I found this made the entire topic of divine judgment much more understandable, starting with Adam and Eve in the garden, death as a process and an event. I'm wondering why he doesn't use this idea of judgment as a process much more often in writings and lectures. Is there a downside he was attempting to avoid? Well, first thing, let's talk about the upside of talking about judgment as process. I'm going to pick a text here that I think is indicative of the situation, which is in uh, Micah 6, 9, right after the famous bumper sticker verse, you know, about, you know, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly but with thy God. But then it continues, The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and a man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Now that's interesting, shall see thy name. In other words, they'll see Jehovah in the way that God's crying out. And so we have this process of a rod. You see, see the rod. The rod is now coming up in this threatened position, and the wise man sees the rod, and who has appointed it? God has appointed the rod of judgment. Now, you can be wise and respond while the rod is being prepared so that you can repent or take the steps necessary to avoid getting hit by it, or you can be a sluggard and slothful in your thinking and get clobbered by it full on, and deservedly so, because it was there to warn. The point of the rod, he says, the, 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 God cries out to them. There's a cry from God himself, and it takes the form of the judgment, and all we're going to do if we neglect it is get hit by that and with subsequent judgments until we pay attention or driven to our knees. So we have a choice here. So there's a rod and it's appointed. In other words, we've made ourselves an appointment with the rod of judgment. 
and it's ways the way that God uh, forms it, and God's name is in the rod itself. There's nothing that is not there's no rod that's inflicted on us, particularly in terms of uh, physical uh, evil, which we're talking about uh, earthquakes and storms and things, where God has not appointed it as a rod against us, because we're told things like this will not go through your land if you are obeying God's law. So, there, here we have it. Hear ye the rod. The wise man hears the rod and pays attention to it. In other words, there's a process, and you can actually affect the process of judgment by repentance. Uh, perchance, um, uh, someone can take steps that will um, set off scripture, you know, the, the, the thing. And we have this example that lots of times, uh, right there in the book of Jonah, right? The king of Nineveh says, maybe if we all repent, then 40 days will still be standing to wiped out like the prophet says. Uh, and so there was no guarantee of it, but they took steps and so the process of judgment, which began with Jonah's appearance and alert, alerting them that the rod is coming, they were able to stave off the rod. And that's why this generation of Nineveh will stand up in judgment against the first century Israel for them refusing the cry of the rod that was appointed through Christ. So they were smarter in their generation than were the Jews in Christ's generation. Okay. So what is the hazard, by the way, of failing to see that um, there is, or overemphasizing process? You overemphasize it to the point that you leave off the final event, that is the final judgment, then you're about one foot into the uh, full preterist camp because then you're saying, well, it's just going to be continual process, continual process. So you want to make it clear that simply because we are now uh, focusing some on current evidences of a rod that's appointed to us, and rightfully so because of our uh, corporate sins, our national sins, our church sins, that was particularly because judgment starts at the house of God, all these things then are, are, are arrayed against us. Uh, it, it then is time to take action. But uh, that said, you cannot put off the final judgment. There's nothing you can do about that. It is a absolute thing. All men must stand or call before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and if Christ is not yours and uh, you're not in him, that's going to be a very, very dreadful day, the dreadful and terrible day of the Lord. Yes, it is. So we want to make sure that we understand that even temporal judgments are not perfect. First off, Lots of times the innocent are swept up in them through no fault of their own. All of the animal creation is swept up in judgment, subjected to futility, according to Romans 8, 19 to 23, through no fault of its own, not because of its own self, but is subjected for man's sake. In other words, the futility to which it's subjected. So too, lots of times the innocent pay a price for the sins of others. Uh, but all of this is rectified at the final judgment. So the final judgment settles all scores evens everything out, deals with and, and apportions out rewards and punishments such that the former things are no longer understood, every tear is wiped away, and then, of course final judgment in its ultimate form, the last rod of all, the lake of fire, exists too at the tail end of history, indicative that God's judge justice is one of his attributes that is not going to go uh, unexampled, as in um, uh, not displayed in its fullness, the manifold wisdom of God from Ephesians 3.10 will be manifested fully. So, so that's the interesting point. Most people think of the, the judgment as something way off there, rather than right now. Right now, uh, interesting point, there's a judge judgment. Yeah, let's go back to the Micah passage, 6. Uh, he talks about various forms of the judgments. Uh, the rich men thereof, this verse 12, are full of violence, the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, their tongue is deceitful, therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied, casting down shall be in the midst of thee. In other words, when it says, thy casting down shall be in the middle of thee, it means it's not external enemies that are coming to level the nation, it's a rot from within, internal rot, or internal destruction. It's, it's interior uh, dissensions and wars and fightings, and devouring one another, as it were. Uh, there's no way to deliver from it. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. This is a form of judgment that's in process. Thou shalt tread the olives, but not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, and shall not drink wine. For the statutes of Amri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation, and the head and heavens thereof in hissing. Therefore, ye shall bear the reproach of my people. Interesting in verse 16, where it says you, the statutes of Amri and the works of the house of Ahab, and you walk in their counsels. These are 
the Old Testament equivalents of um, it's the law. You know, uh, we're supposed to the, the notion that if it's been written, we have to obey it. But God is here saying, uh, you are in fact keeping the statutes of Omri, and I'm going to judge you for it. Judgment because these statutes are against God's judgments. They are opposed to what God requires. They are, in fact, humanistic anti-law that is uh, a positivistic law that is put in place instead of God's law, and God's law is set aside, and his statutes are laughed at and scorned, and instead we put in place uh, this allegedly new humanistic law. And uh, God actually holds them responsible, and says one of the sources of judgment is that you're actually obeying these things rather than overturning them in favor of biblical law. Now, there's a right way to handle that and to put biblical law in place from the ground up, grassroots up. But so long as the people are walking and approving in the old councils and statutes that are wrong, uh, and they know that they are, uh, that's the cause of desolation, then they will be very much richly earning it. So there's process in all these things. In Haggai, they're told that they are putting money into a purse, but because they're not seeing that God's house is built, the purse has a hole in it. And they uh, sowed much but reaped very little. These are forms of pro judgment in process, if you will. So you need to be wise. You need to see, hear the rod, hear the cry of God, hear the rod, and who appointed it. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at that passage in um, uh, Micah 6, let me grab it again. Hopefully my Bible ribbon is still there. Yes, it is. Hear ye the rod. Isn't that interesting? It didn't say watch or look for look at the rod, it says, hear ye the rod. In other words, the effect of the rod can be heard from a distance before you can see it. In other words, a judgment is coming at you in stages, and it comes from a, from, uh, from a distance, rumblings and things like that. Catch it while you can hear it, because once you see it, it's probably already on the way down on your head. So that's the message here. God is the judge. He is uh, a king, a lawgiver, a judge. He will save us, Isaiah thirty three twenty two. There's not one of these offices of God that overshadow the others. He's all of these equally, internally, infinite, infinitely. And so let's make sure we understand ourselves here. No mistake. Okay, great question, Ford. Love it. Do you see any modern application to the levirate practice as outlined in the Old Testament and exemplified by Ruth and Boaz? Of course, uh, we might actually get into an example of um, when John the Baptist is criticizing Herod Antipas uh, for being with his brother's wife. Uh, one of the reasons, even if Philip was dead, that it may not have been still lawful for him to have Herodias, is that the Leverate passage of 25.5, would have, uh, Deuteronomy 25.5, would have kicked in since they had a daughter, Salome, and uh, we would have needed to have a son. And so he would not have been the next in line su succession. So, so long as that uh, law was still in place, John the Baptist was going to enforce it uh, on Herod Antipas. Well, of course, he had this other issue that uh, it was his brother's wife, not his brother's widow, so his brother was still alive, uh, but because of the fact he didn't have apparently a, a male seed, they, even then it would have been disallowed. So this comes up with another question that's coming up here right behind it. Is there any prohibition in Scripture for a widower to marry his sister-in-law after the death of his wife? And that's going to be depending on other factors. So let's talk about this um, leverate practice. I believe that what likely happens is that here the Spirit of the Lord is translated into the New Covenant era. And I like the way that Dr. Rashtuni seemed to find an example of it in the most peculiar place, extraordinary place, in the case of a United States president, the only president who had non-contiguous terms, Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland, the reason that he become evidence is the spirit of the levirate, uh, which is to say uh, someone who is um, in a situation where they, there is no husband, uh, for whatever reason, this was an interesting reason, uh, that, that lacking is fulfilled somehow, that someone stands in that gap. So Grover Cleveland was accused falsely, uh, as it turned out, of having sp uh, fathered a child out of wedlock. Um, in fact, never married this, this woman. The, it was a false charge. Nonetheless, he provided for the woman and the child out of his own substance financially. He dutifully took care of them, despite the fact of the charge. And uh, people thought, well, this is going to ruin this man, because this is a tantamount admission, a tacit admission, really, implicit ambition that he's guilty. Uh, and he didn't care. He said, I'm just going to take care of the we need here. 
So in essence, he, he came into this spot as if he were a levirate, um, not necessarily raising a, a seed for the, anyone else, as it were, but rather from a distance seeing that she was taken care of. Uh, she saw to the needs of the widow and orphan in a sense, if you want to use a very general stretched version of, uh, of that, those terms. And then it came out much later that, in fact, there was proof positive he wasn't guilty of having sired the child and that he knew it the entire time. So sometimes the spirit of the liberate law can live on even after the ordinance is gone. And we can see, uh, as Richard Street said, we don't see Christian character like this today. Yeah, we are on tough times, hunger-bitten times, and we are feeding on corn husks when it comes to that. So um, I'm going to go to the next question. What is the best way to take back uh, correct definitions when others have co-opted them and thereby given them a negative connotation? Uh, you know, this is interesting. Uh, I had this exact same discussion with um, some folks about the term totalism. Now, what uh, totalism did not used to mean, <laughs> did not used to mean what it now means, which is a very oppressive, tyrannical system that controls every element of your thought as if it was a form of brainwashing. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, there's no liberties, no uh, will room, and, uh, and uh, obviously that would be a cultish approach. That is not what it, when, when we talk about it, uh, and we, in history the term is a little bit more different. It simply means that the Bible applies to all things, and that uh, there's nothing, no atom of God that he created that he doesn't have authority over, and that many times the Word of God speaks to, and therefore we can, in fact, speak to it as well. Uh, and... <clears throat> So now here's this word, the totalism. If I use the word totalism, uh, I mean it in one sense, and someone else means it in the absolute pejorative sense. I mean it positively, and they see it as the greatest wickedness. So we're, we're talking past each other, and then they insist, well, everyone uses the term this way. You have to then kowtow. You don't have the authority uh, simply because it's an, you have an older term, and you, you're just a small little group. The vast majority of the world is now you know, hijacked this term, and, and uh, you guys are the odd man out. So that becomes interesting because there's subversion here, and subversion starts with language. Uh, maybe Ground Control can um, put up an article about the strategy of subversion. Uh, I think I'm the author of it, but it it's also points to Rushdoony. Rushdoony, I think, actually wrote something along the same lines, and that you could get an idea what happens, because if you can subvert language, then the rest comes into play. And I dealt with this uh, just recently in you know, lectures in Pennsylvania, and down in Australia, I dealt with the same question about how you can subvert language and use that to control people. Uh, one way that some people have said is, well, let's just restore the ancient pathways. Let me grab an 1828 Noah Webster dictionary, and that's my guide to new definitions. I'm going to stick with that. And you can certainly go quite a ways with that, but it doesn't uh, serve to uh, cast down all the imaginations that are arrayed uh, against Christ and his kingdom, right? Where to uh, the strongholds are still there, and we still need to attack them frontally and take back those definitions. Now, one way that you can take back definitions is to build a new dictionary, and then get a lot of buy-in on it. Uh, and that certainly was exactly what Noah Webster was doing when he put his Christian dictionary out there, the world's first lexicographer. Uh, he knew what he was doing. By the same token, uh, Diderot, Denis Diderot, the uh, creator of the world's first encyclopedia. That was a humanistic enterprise, and he was deliberately taking every thought captive to, to humanism and, and away from Christianity. So these projects, these things exist and are there as large edifices, large, huge strongholds that all need to be torn down. They have to be torn down with the sword of the spirit, not with um, humanistic weapons, not with weapons of the flesh, not physical altercation or anything like that, but rather the spirit, not by, my, not by power, but my spirit, saith the Lord. So there are mechanisms in place. But we need to then elevate ourselves to the point where we have the firepower to go after them and, and, and be, not be cowardly about it. Thank you. Great. Strategy of subversion. Perfect. Thank you, ground control. Um, best way, I think, we need to use all biblical methods. I don't think there's one best way. Each um, discipline and, and area of concern has its own different ways that need to be dealt with it. Banking might have a different approach to definitions than, say, someone else, uh, than the sciences. Um, and then the, the, how the soft sciences, so-called, versus the hard sciences, the life sciences, the physical sciences, you know, the arts, what do we do with arts? You know, we can't even define certain things like what is, what is music. Uh, no one's going to agree on that definition because it's such a broad area of cultural concern. So that means that you need to raise new foundations. 
uh, if you uh, if you have a situation where those foundations are missing and a lot of those happen to do with definitions, you're in a bad way. I think it was Gary North who correctly said, he who defines wins. So uh, Orwell dealt with this too. If you can alter language like you did in 1984, then you can take away the necessary terms to, to embody certain ideas. And those ideas then become disembodied. They are no longer uh, in uh, currency. No one has a way to express the idea, so the idea itself and the notions behind it, the concepts behind it, die because they can't be expressed. They've been um, skewered, if you will. So, therefore, to align the testimony to speak now is according to these, because there's no light in them. So we always go back, 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 back to these ancient landmarks um, because they speak for all time. And like I said earlier in the conversation, they will stand when the universe is dust, or less than dust. Okay. Next question. Interesting. Is being consistent the same as being faithful? Well, I think you can be consistently unfaithful, obviously. Um, and so, lots of times, if we are inconsistent, sometimes it's a glorious inconsistency. I think it's a glorious inconsistency that certain folks with a given eschatology that what we would consider more pessimistic are still busy dealing with certain things and taking dominion over that area, despite the fact that it's apparently inconsistent with their eschatological view. So here we say, well, thank God for the inconsistency that uh, it's not affecting their walk in such a way as to cut short God's working through them uh, and their families to do good and to uh, give something good to the next generation. Uh, but faithfulness is interesting because um, it can some, I imagine it can sometimes look inconsistent. Uh, I'm coming sh shy of an example, but I probably will by maybe by the end of the conversation or by next week. I'll make a tick mark on this and uh, not, not put a literal tick on it, but uh, a tick mark, and then we'll see if I can't uh, give an example that might be more useful on this. Uh, now, why do we even ask this question? Sometimes we try to drive someone to be consistent. He says, you're not consistent with your own position. If you actually held to this, you'd be doing this, this, this. And so we try to, if we see someone uh, having antinomies and different things um, that are opposed to each other in their mind, we think all we have to do is straighten them out. They have a, a mental problem. Well, as in a problem that is intellectual or epistemological, obviously all we've got to do is fix these antinomies. You know, what does that best is systematics, and this is what um, Warfield kept saying. He says, you know, because we've been deprived of the strong discipline of the past, uh, it's astonishing the kind of things that coexist and live in our minds together that are enemies of each other, and yet we hold them in our minds simultaneously, even though uh, they oppose or are in opposition. Uh, and so it takes systematics to alter that, to realize then to take the biblical truths and set them in their relationship one to another so that you have a new truth, which is the relationship of these truths comprises, you know. Uh, uh, the example that I give is that the truths of Scripture are like so much pieces of lumber all the way around. They're all true, but they're not built into a building yet. Uh, they're just on the ground, unconstructed. But if you put them together in their relationships, then you have a building. Then you have everything up to the capstone. And that can, is the thing that you want. You don't want just to have just a bunch of diverse truths out there, but you want to put them together. And it's in the process of putting them together that the flaws start to show up. If, uh, if there's inconsistency, then that's going to appear. I had, uh, again, challenged in a group which, um, on Facebook. I said, someone was explaining, well, of course, the land prophet promises in Ezekiel 47 are clear. And I said, that's interesting because in Obadiah, we have a very, very different set of land promises where... Uh, Benjamin occupies the Transjordan, I should go this way, which is uh, your direction would be uh, eastward. And uh, Judah occupies all of Canaan, all the other ten tribes, and, and below to Edom. And then all the other ten tribes are north of the northern boundary of Israel. I said, now who's right? Uh, you guys have a view of the millennium, and you're convinced that Ezekiel 47 gives you the land divisions, but Obadiah, Obadiah is just as clearly giving land divisions of the future of Israel, which one's the right one. So now I'm going to ask them to be consistent. Because now the Bible is putting out a very serious inconsistency uh, if you are trying to take these things literally. And these are really a, a red flags to say neither of these pictures is the literal picture. They actually both describe a spiritual reality uh, in the future and is being misconstrued when you try to actually make it literal. any event, the point there is that uh, someone can hold something and not realize that it's inconsistent with another scripture. And when you bring it up, you get the crickets, unfortunately. See, the serious person will say, you know, I need to deal with that. That, that is a serious challenge to my position. 
I think the same thing is true of uh, the passage in Hebrews 8, 4, and 5 about the priesthood of Christ and being tied to his kingship, which is taught in uh, Zechariah 6, 12 and Psalm 110. And here this verse says if he's on earth, he can't be a priest. And so that means if he's supposed to be a king and a priest at the same time, a, a priest upon his throne, as Zechariah 6 puts it, then we got a really serious problem. But instead of actually grappling with that, which means being consistent with the scriptures, people tend more to flee and to set that aside and pretend. They whistle and they assume there's no problem and they can go on and uh, and continue to spout the original doctrine, even though they've been challenged and shown that it's got a big con inconsistency with it. Sometimes this is a glorious one where they are operating correctly, even though their ideas are mistaken, and that's a great thing. Or uh, here's another problem, of course, we face. We have people who are very, very biblically consistent who are not actually walking according to what they know. So their knowledge is fine, but the walk is deficient. Uh, and the word for that in the scripture tends to be hypocrite, saying one thing and, and leading others to something. Like that. Okay. So, uh, three more questions. Sorry if they were taking so long on these, but then we'll be done with the, the write-ins. The write-in ballots. <laughs> these are provisionals right here. Some evangelical leaders are promoting the idea of incarnational leadership and incarnational ministry. Two questions. Is this merely a misuse of the term, and two, is it heretical? Well, if it's heretical, of course, it would be a misuse at least of something. But here's my, my concern Anytime you say that. If this ministry really is a literal incarnation of Christ, you really, there is no accountability anymore for it because it's incarnational. Christ is incarnate. Um, the Spirit is incarnate and working through it. So it is above reproach, above criticism, above even biblical analysis, after all, whether we just declared it to be incarnational. Now, in one sense, um, if you're saying, well, we simply need to incarnate as, as in put uh, legs and, and boots on the ground and hands to work for Christ's mission, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but in the sense that all of a sudden we have this new name and uh, it's what the name could eventually imply down the line that becomes uh, dangerous. And so, so it all depends on the use. Someone could use it in a very, say, a less charismatic way, indicating that, you know, what Christ won, we're the body of Christ, and uh, therefore he's the head, we're the body, therefore we should act like it. I'm fine with that. That's perfectly clear and legitimate. It's when an idea that might actually otherwise be good is taken to an extreme, and it jumps off the deep end, and boom, we have a problem. So I think I have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm sure some people can take this too far, and uh, when it is taken too far, you have the fundamental issue that now the if the church actually literally incarnates Christ, then there's an identity of the church and Christ's body to the point that the infallibility inheres in the church itself, and now we have a big problem, a serious, dangerous problem, because we have gone beyond the scripture. All right, second last, second last question. When dealing with people who appear to be unashamedly inconsistent in their views, for example, I know abortion is murder, but I still think a woman has the right to choose, is it correct to assume that they are not regenerate? After all, wouldn't the Holy Spirit testify to them otherwise? Well, there are you know, lots of folks that, uh, you know, they certainly act like they're unregenerate from one point of view because that is certainly the counsel of the ungodly at that stage. But uh, to think that Christians are not capable of sinning and that requiring repentance down the line uh, is a misnomer. Certainly Christians can be as compromised as the next person. And it's sad that it's true, but it's, it is the reality today. And perhaps we can say, why are they getting this idea? Why do they think that they can, these two things can coexist? Because now they're talking about a right to choose, right? So now we've elevated a doctrine of human rights. Now we bring back, say, Ingram's great study, what is wrong with human rights? And because the scripture only speaks in terms of human duties and responsibilities and not rights. <laughs> and then, of course, in terms of liberty. Uh, but that's a whole different ballgame than rights, and certainly the right to choose to kill. Um, so if they're trying to say they don't believe that the civil magistrate should govern this, that's a whole different ballgame too, uh, because the civil magistrate is there to wield a sword against evil doors. And to say that murdering an innocent child is not evil is, of course, a complete subversion of language again, going back three, three questions. So yeah, it's a serious problem. Uh, we like to think better, but of course we're going to find ourselves always correcting one another, uh, and sometimes the question, the correction is not welcome. Sometimes different parts of the church. If you go to a very liberal Presbyterian church, you're going to get this exact position. 
They might not even think it's murder. They might have a whole different idea about it. Uh, and they might have a theology to justify it. Now, it's not anchored to Scripture, mind you. And if it is, it's, it is done in the most tendentious, uh, piecemeal, cherry-picking way. And I can't even imagine how you could pull that off. But assuming they could, uh, then you simply need to then go back to exegetical analysis and moral confrontation on exactly this point. Because the murder of the innocent is not to be taken now, the first question is, the Holy Spirit testified to them otherwise. Certainly, someone can resist the Spirit, right? Now, and that's the other point, is that they, they may know in the heart of hearts it's murder, uh, and still, for expeditious reasons, justify it the way that this question puts it. And so they can quench the Spirit or resist it. And I think this is why we have this fascinating verse in James 4, verse 5, which says, do you think the Scripture... Uh, uh, is uh, in vain that saith that the spirit uh, uh, is it that's in you lusteth to envy, which is to say that the Holy Spirit that dwells in us sees that the love and authority and, and the obedience that we owe to it is squandered on the things of this world and the false things and idols. And so you can understand why the spirit would be very, very upset about this, why it is lusteth to envy, is jealous that the love that it should be receiving, he should be receiving more accurately, is directed elsewhere. And so, so it is with Christians. And then here it is, James talking to us Christians about this very thing. The, the Holy Spirit who dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. So this is a very serious dynamic where sin brings into play our treachery toward God. Um, and if it persists till the end, then I don't believe that there's any more room for repentance at that point. This person has been self-deceived his entire life as to their Christian status. And uh, the Holy Spirit wasn't there either. Okay, finally, uh, and we actually dealt with this a little bit earlier. God's Word tells us that judgment is the real consequences of unrepented sin. In the case of the fires in California, some object when it's stated that this is God's judgment on our society. They take exception, responding with, you don't know why God is doing this. Can we err in saying too much, or is that a valid statement since the loss of life property, etc., can, certainly can't be classified as a blessing, except in a Romans 8.28 sense, by which all things work together. So, here's the deal. I think we're this is where we mess up. We're going to um, see a judgment, and then we're going to pick our favorite hobby horse sin that we, our culture is guilty of and say, aha, this is because of X. And this is a judgment upon sin X. How do you know that? <laughs> you see, in the passage his is here in Micah 6, do you know why all these judgments, why the rod is coming and marching in to, uh, to Israel? It's right there in the uh, verse 10. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? You see, it was monetary inflation was the cause. And we have that here in spades. No one's going to go through and look at the fire in paradise or in the Woolsey fire and say, this is due to monetary inflation, because you would sound like an idiot, but you'd actually probably be much closer to the biblical truth of it, uh, and because God does, in fact, send rods for this and says he did it. And he, uh, the, the, that's why the destruction of the nation occurs from the middle out. From the midst of these shall your falling down occur. Uh, so oftentimes we use our pet peeves and then bring them into the table and say this is why X and Y is happening. And we don't know that for a fact. It could be some other reason entirely. Uh, some people think, well, there was a reason why uh, they were tossed out of, um, for 70 years, out of, um, um, to Babylon uh, and the diaspora, the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews and their exile to Babylon. But the one that the Bible gives, and most of you reading and listening to us would know, it's because they failed to keep the land Sabbaths. And they failed to keep those land Sabbaths for 490 years worth of land Sabbaths were missed. And uh, Jeremiah announces, my land shall enjoy her Sabbaths. God asserts it. And so they're going to be exiled, so the land will rest fallow for 70 years. So they had plenty of other sins of which they're guilty of. But the thing that was the precipitating sin was not the one that people might have thought it was. Uh, because, one, they thought of getting away with it, right? Uh, how is it possible that we would have this judgment, given that God has apparently winked at it for five centuries? Well, guess what? God's got a long memory. He was uh, 70 times 7 forgiving them, and then all repentance was gone on God's part. 
and that was the end of it. There was no repentance left, and then God said, My land will enjoy her Sabbaths. All 70 of them will continuously be observed while you're out in Babylon. So, let's be clear that, it's, that we don't know the exact sins, cultural sins, that might give rise to judgment and where there, those sins occurred. Uh, but we do know that God would protect his people when they are glorifying him, and that means all the law of God is being kept. This is laid out in Isaiah 4, verse 5. It's interesting we had you know, 4, 4, and 4, 5, but 4, 5. We just had James 4, 5. Now we have Isaiah 4, 4, 5. Isaiah 4, 5 says, Upon all the glory shall be a defense, which is where God is glorified, God puts a protection, a hedge, a covering that protects. And so it's because to the extent that God is being defied, that that hedge, that protection is gone, and then you are opening yourselves up to all sorts of attacks. Uh, and judgments, which can be a process, and they all end up in the great judgment, which is also a lake of fire. So, okay, here's a question that came in from Kevin. Let's see if I can hold it, see the whole question. Tick, tick, I'll pin it. Much of the emphasis on modern Calvinistic preaching is focused only on the cross, and they use the words of Paul that he seeks to know only Christ crucified as the basis. Is the, the resurrection the catalyst of the Christian faith? Uh, well, yeah, but catalyst, it means it sits in motion, uh, conquerors, victory, victory over death, victory over the things that belong to death and the domain of death, victory over sin. Uh, you know, that's the whole point is that laid out in John 12, 31, 32, right? Is that uh, I, if I be lifted up out of the earth, shall draw all men unto myself. So that is the catalyst of all Christian faith, and, it, and so was the starting point. Also, uh, Paul knows things beyond Christ crucified. He even talks about this notion about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That doesn't. Uh, uh, and what does he speak about when he talks about Christ crucified? Is that his his message, which he used to take to the Gentiles, uh, which is the gospel message? You know, he he did not want to labor where someone else had already labored. He wanted to go where there was a new area. So he was getting people in the faith, and of course, it's not necessarily appropriate to say, I'm going to talk to you about some tithes as versus um, Christ crucified and our need for Christ crucified, etc., etc. Also, uh, truly enough, when you, pit, is, you can't have a resurrected Christ without a crucified Christ. And it's the crucifixion, of course, the, the, the atonement that uh, purchased Christ the great victory. We talked about this last week in the concluding verses of Isaiah 53 and then entering into verse 54. See now, see the whole thing now. Are there other questions ahead before? Chicago looks like we've. Okay, so I only had the one question from Kevin. See if anything else pops up on the feed. Time wise, we have another 14 minutes, so we shall see if anything else pops up. Otherwise, we'll probably be ending early, which is okay. Um, again, a reminder, while I have a little bit of dead air, we do have another Book of the Month Club coming up uh, in the first Monday of December, where I will be discussing the Foundations of Social Order uh, by Dr. Resh Dooney, about the Creeds and Councils of the Early Church. Uh, myself and uh, Andrea will be moving along. If you haven't signed up for it, please do. Uh, if you miss it, you can always listen in afterward, but you can't ask live questions because it's, it's a tape that's already done. Done deal. Uh, so that'd be one place to go. And if you want to send questions in advance, then simply just pop them in over to ask.calcedon at calcedon.edu. And we will get to them first, as we did this time, and walk through a whole bunch of them, and uh, then see what comes of it. Any other questions popping up? Ground control? If we're going to run short today, well, that's going to be interesting. I did not expect that to happen. Well, the um, one thing for sure, we're coming up close to Thanksgiving, and uh, I think gratitude is a Christian virtue that often goes, um, we give it short shrift too often. We need to be very, very grateful and thankful to the Lord. Remember in the list in Romans 1, it says of those people that were the, the reprobate, neither were they grateful. That's a stunning thing. Okay, I see a question came up here. Could you please compare 1 Peter 3, 7? Let me pull it up. The 
Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And then 1 Corinthians 7.14. For an unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, and but now they are holy. So we have the question of the sanctification, which is positional, as uh, they say, versus the issue of dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. I think you have certainly have a, a Christian marriage here with both partners in Christ in uh, 1 Peter 3. Uh, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And they're praying together. This, the, the composite is both prayers. The prayers, joint prayers, are being unhindered. Um, by the way, it's very important um, to dwell with them according to knowledge. I think that this correlates with what Paul later says concerning washing with the water of the word. That it's very, very important that the, the wife is as astute in Scripture as... Um, as the husband, not to be far, far away behind, left in the lurch. Although the, the husband goes on, and that, I think that's also important. Honor, honor. But I'm not sure I see anything other different other than in the one text we see a uh, asymmetric marriage where one partner is a Christian, the other is not, and their obligations under that circumstance. And also there's the status such that the children are in a good place, um, which is to be in the Lord. So I think that'd be as far as I would take that, Douglas, at least at this point, unless you had a more specific question. Um, recommended works on a Christian perspective of music. Actually, we're trying to work on that. If you like, I can certainly send you my five essays. Uh, anyone wants to um, private message me, uh, it's a PDF uh, where I've written on the topic in 82, 83, 85, 2001, 2010. Uh, and those are probably the, a good starting place but music is an interesting area because we have, um, I think, some misconceptions. That's why you know, I tend to have opportunities to lecture on it, especially on it alone. Uh, I have, it was one of the very first public lectures I gave for Cal Seed and was on the reconstruction of music. And uh, we need to continue developing these ideas. I actually have a book in the works all this time since 82. And I still haven't finished it, so it's one of those big projects that's sitting there in an incomplete form. And I see, boy, it would be beneficial if I were to have a position to complete it, but I've not been able to. But it, uh, I have an enormous library that deals exactly with this issue, and there's a worldview problem that comes into play with music that is not often understood. And also there is the question of what constitutes literacy, and the fact that so much in Scripture deals with music, and we often don't apply it the way it's actually written in Scripture. Okay, we pinned there the third month of the, the book of the month club. Okay, great, December 3rd. That's the exact date that we're going to have that. And that's been pinned by ground control. So if you have not signed up for yet for the uh, book of the month club, do so. There's still time to read the book because it's not that thick a book, Foundations of Social Order. You can go ahead and grab that anytime. Well, yeah, I don't mind leaving, closing out eight minutes early. It's not going to kill us. We will meet again next Sunday. Oh, yes, that's good. There's a place where you can get it. And, and uh, Ground Control, is it not also available as a Kindle, as an ebook? You can certainly read it for free online, though a lot of people find Scrib D kind of um, frustrating. Other people are perfectly fine because the price is right. But there you go. You can go with that route. Anything else going on? Okay, no. Uh, next week, will we be convening on the 25th of November, my 62nd birthday, so we'll celebrate our birthday with some Q&As on every topic except my birthday. So we'll um, know if there are no other questions, and I'll see if there's any more. Nope. We will then catch everyone next week on the 25th. And again, when you, um, it's important that in terms of Thanksgiving that we're grateful every single day. Uh, that is so important because it acknowledges our dependence on God for everything. And it's the, uh, one of the big, big flaws of humanism is this notion of their independence. And uh, it is a colossal mistake, and it's going to cost them their souls to go that way. So let's not fall into the same trap. We'll catch up with everyone next week. God bless. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti. 
We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit calcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in all that you do.